Hello and welcome to Premier Injuries again. This is Premier Pundits and we've got another Tactic Thursday for you with Tristan Thomas. Now, as always, we kind of go through something that is in the ether at the moment. But before we get into it all, I always like people to know how brilliant you are, Tristan, why we've got you on. So just explain to people who might be new to the channel into what kind of work you do and why I've got you on, because you've got a very unique set of skills, don't you, Tristan? Yeah, thanks for the intro. Um, So what I do every day is uh, I sit in front of um, a laptop and watch videos of football and go through data and numbers uh, to try and make players better and teams better and coaches better. So that's a short summary of of what it is. Um, I work at a company in Prague called Eleven Hacks um, and we have a number of of clients, as I mentioned, clubs and and players. And um, yeah, we work to improve them using video analysis and and data analysis. So um, I'm really, really fortunate to be in a role where I get to watch football is my job. Um, sometimes the lines get blurred between work and, and fun. But um, yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a great role to be in, certainly. And one of the other reasons, as well as the data and tactical knowledge that you have, is you've been on the coaching side for many years in football. So you've got that ability to almost understand from the inside of a club perspective, because quite often people who are in these positions, these data or tactical analysts kind of go, oh, well, this is happening or this is happening, but they don't understand the inner workings of a club, which is why I say it's quite unique that you've got these kind of double-edged um, skill sets that allow you to see inside and outside of the club. And as always, I say, make sure to like, subscribe and share these videos here on Premier Injuries, but also check out Tristan on Twitter. There's a, a lot of good stuff. Well, you're not as active as you used to be on there, but still give you a follow and you always ask, uh, well, you always answer questions that people put to you. But today we are asking and answering questions about Brighton Hove Albion. They're one of the teams that I think are one of the most fascinating in the Premier League. And what I would say recently, you might correct me here though, Tristan, is that they're finally having some movement towards Brighton's good underlying data the results are matching this stuff the seagulls are unbeaten in their last six their longest unbeaten record in the premier league and five clean sheets in 2021 which has previously been kind of a rarity and hard to come by the underlying numbers as i've said have improved too this season so let's explore if this good kind of run of fixtures is down to luck or improvement in quality so Kind of from the data perspective, Tristan, do you think that Brighton are matching their stuff or or is this a lucky run? Yeah, so to kind of zoom out massively, um, like most pundits and fans like to speak about the games and results week on week. Obviously, so-and-so played well, this team played well, this team are leaking goals at the back. And obviously, those kind of micro week-to-week things are so important in football. Um, and it's coaches and players' jobs to, to maximise that performance as much as possible. But Brighton, overall as a club in recent seasons, in, in all departments, have got a great kind of direction and a very forward-thinking and modern um, way in which they run. And they've got a technical director, Dan Ashworth, who was um, absolutely instrumental in the FA in you know creating the kind of talented generation that um, had that success a few summers ago and is coming through now into the men's senior team and and some talented coaches coming through the ranks also. So, um, yeah, they've kind of got such a great direction, unbelievable recruitment, using data a lot. Um, Obviously, myself working for this company, Eleven Hacks, that helps clubs with uh, recruitment and data, there's been a number of players that have kind of been flagged up by our, uh, our data and flagged up by our scouts that is probably just out of the, the price limit of some of the clubs we work for, but Brighton have picked up. Um, uh, there's, there's a few interesting yeah, players in, the re- in recent years and their recruitment has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, they've, they've, missed the, the tar- they've yeah, sort of missed the target on a few of them, but mostly we're talking Lamptey, for example, um, coming in this, this summer, um, Trossard a few, a few summers ago. 
with Mopay uh, a couple of years ago. Some really, really great recruitment. Uh, and then in terms of play style and coaching, they've got the best English coach or head coach manager, in my opinion, uh, right now, which is Graham Potter. Um, plays very, very good football. Someone with a very interesting football journey. Um, so, yeah, a very good club uh, that have done very, very well all season. Potter had to completely change the style last season from, from Chris Hewton the season before, where they were in a low block most of the time. Um, they were using a lot of long balls, counter-attacks, never really played out from the back that much, and he had to develop that style in his first season. And then now he's, his second season at the club, um, yeah, they've flourished, for, in my opinion, from, from the start of the season, based on, like you said, the underlying numbers and expected goals and expected points. Um, they were always underperforming before Christmas. Um, I, I saw some some pundits, so it was Gary Neville, um, said that Brighton were going to go down. He said that around around Christmas, that he, he fancied them to go down. And looking at the expected points, they were like fifth, sixth, seventh best team in the league. So really uh, uh, kind of interesting how that form has recently regressed to the mean. Um, and I've, I've got it here recently over the, oh, sorry, over the whole season. They've gained 1.6 expected points per game. Um, and they've actually only achieved 1.1 1 .1, uh, real points per game. So still underperforming, even though in the last six games they've been absolutely brilliant, um, and they've had about two points per game in the last six games, uh, around two expected points per game as well. So I'm so happy to see them finally regress to that mean. And the interesting thing as well is it's been three seasons worth of improvements, as you said there, you know, the last season of Chris Hewton, the side had scored 35 goals, 0.92 per game, and goals against were 1.58 per game or 60. Then last season, they scored a little bit more and they conceded a little bit less. So more with 1.03 per game and with goals against 1.42 per game. But there was also the interesting upturn in their underlying XG data, as you've explained there. And in this season, we've seen 1.04 goals per game, which is only a slight improvement, but you look at that amazing goals against 30 so far, but 1.25 per game conceded. This is really excellent stuff. But to kind of understand why they've possibly turned things around this season quite well, I'd like you to talk us through a summary of Brighton's play style and also why they are one of your favourite teams in the league. So you've kindly put together a tactical video for us on screen to explain the build-up play and also how they react and, and press as well. So Tristan, can you just talk us through what are the amazing foibles of the Seagulls? Yeah, so they're a very tactically um, fluid or, or, or tactically adaptable team like so for example they've been using three at the back mostly recently but that's not always been uh, a 3-5-2 for example or for example teams that have been successful recently in recent years playing three out from the back um, Conte for example at Chelsea pretty much always played 3-4-3 they're slightly different where it's sometimes 3-5-2 sometimes um, there's there's like one number 10, sorry, behind two strikers in a 3-5-2. Sometimes it's one pivot behind two kind of number eights in a 3-5-2. Um, or even recently against Aston Villa at the, at the weekends, they played like a 3-1-4-1-1 a one, 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 or like a three diamonds midfield, wing backs pushing high, uh, and then Mope as a striker. So, um, yeah, in terms of their, of their build-up play, um, when they were playing out from the back, and they dominated possession in this game. Dunk would move slightly to the left side and then White would kind of drop in um, like a right centre backward and then Byrne would move into more of a traditional left back position. So he wasn't high up the pitch but he was sort of wide on the left which allowed Alzati to move high wide on the left side and pin back uh, the right back of, of Villa. Um, whereas Veltman was, came into more of like a attacking right back position on the right side. They had um, the diamond in midfield with Basuma constantly moving in front of Dunk, trying to um, get on the ball as much as possible. Uh, and then they had the overload in midfield with the four versus three that they used really well, um, which they could even make five versus three if Mopay dropped in occasionally in the right moments. 
So um, yeah, they always had that overload, that extra man, and they used that really effectively to find the extra man in midfield and progress through the first line of press of, of Aston Villa. Um, and then we can see here with a different uh, video, so more when they're in the middle third, Villa's press had to start to kind of drop off or allow Brighton more of the ball because of this 4v3 situation in the midfield with the diamond. Um, so Watkins, the Villa centre forward, was moving closer to Basuma um, and the Villa midfielders were then closer kind of man to man um, or, or blocking the spaces in midfield more, um, which allows Brighton to keep the ball between the back three more easily. But then Trossard would make really nice runs um, onto the last line to uh, create like a 3v3 situation, give Villa's left back a decision whether to stay close to the centre backs and not isolate them 2v2, which would leave Veltman in space. Um, so, yeah, it was a really great example of how good Brighton are tactically, how flexible they are, um, how they can use their natural diamonds that you have in that three diamond, three shape as well to. Uh, to create good passing angles and to allow the team to keep possession. So in possession, it was a, a fantastic performance. Um, and as we can see, even in terms of creating chances, even they scored no goals, but they created 2.2 expected goals um, compared to just 0 0.18, which um, statistically gave them a 88% chance of winning. So a very, very good performance. And yeah, incredible really that they didn't manage to get the win. This is something that we will come on to in a little bit with the underperformance of their front line. But between the sticks, we do have to focus our attention because you've talked about their great acquisitions, their ability to find these diamonds in the rough. And I think one of the huge stories this season that maybe people don't even realise is Sanchez and the quality he gives to that team as the goalkeeper. You talk there as well of this, this well, this whole side upturn and going from underachievement for so, so long and finally matching or overachieving expected data for the first time since the end of last season. And kind of just throwing numbers at you here, Matt Ryan had a 4.2, sorry, minus 4.2 XG prevented this season, whereas so far Sanchez has a plus 0.3 XG prevented so far. So he's not prevented one whole goal yet, but even there, he's not letting them in like Matt Ryan did. And also looking at eight goals conceded from an XGA of 5.75 from set pieces this season, we kind of see that Matt Ryan was a problem where Brighton are usually quite strong at set pieces. So is he the reason for a, a huge upturn over the whole squad or is it more that this organisation that they've got this play style together in the second half of the season Tristan? Yeah I think um, Matt Ryan isn't a bad goalkeeper and I think the kind of data that you've outlined there and the data um, I have as well on, on the, the difference between the two of them definitely suggests that he wasn't performing at the same level as he did in previous seasons um, and also he wasn't performing to the level that uh, Sanchez is now, certainly. Um, so, yeah, I think it has been a, a big difference or, or a, a decent sized difference having a goalkeeper that's that's uh, got great concentration and focus and can uh, step up to the plate when required. Um, and also Sanchez seems to be more aggressive in terms of his positioning behind Brighton's like higher line at times and uh, it's very good with his feet as well which is important for, for a goalkeeper in that system in Graham Potter's possession based football system so um, I think uh, it's kind of a cliche but it's certainly true that having someone between the sticks that the, the defence can trust in and that kind of breeds confidence throughout the whole team so um, yeah I think a uh, goalkeeping area has certainly be one that Brighton have shown their, their great recruitment to, to find someone who can fit in and be probably one of the best goalkeepers of the season since he's come in. And the defensive improvements of the team don't just come from the goalkeeper though. Comparing the defensive data of last season to this one, there's been a big upturn in the quality at the back. Looking at the defensive data 2019-20, the team had goals conceded per game 12th, 
in the league. 2.2 big chances conceded per 90. 91 shots in the box conceded per game, which was 16th best in the league, well below, uh, you know, it, almost in the relegation zone. And 13.2 shots conceded per game was also 12. Total clean sheets, 9. Whereas this season, they've almost matched those total clean sheets with eight so far. But the amazing thing for me is some of this data is top four slash European places. Um, goals conceded per game, this is where they've underachieved so far. They're ninth best with 1.25, but then 1.5 big chances conceded per game, sixth best. 2.5 attempts from set plays per game, uh, fourth best. Six shots in the box conceded per game, fourth best and nine shots conceded per game fourth best this is this is sensational stuff here so is it down to tactics or is it down to some of those personnel brought in as well the likes of Tariq Lamperty and also Ben White coming back from Leeds yeah so quickly on the on the kind of mismatch between their data in terms of expected goals against which um, like you said they've been kind of underperforming it's very good I've third best in the league expected goals against um, is pro and you said the shots in the box was very very good as well shots in the box against um, I think that comes with the back three slightly as well where you've got three big centre backs that are controlling or defending key zones in the penalty area so when you're against like a low block like they like so when the, you're in a low block like you were like they were against uh, Liverpool for example those three centre backs can control the key zones in the penalty area, but then you might concede a bit of space in front of them because they've got Basuma, who's a very, very good defensive midfielder. But then if you look at Gross and McAllister, they're not offering that defensive solidity uh, as well as Basuma. I know they've played White um, a few times in defensive midfield as well. Um, so they probably are conceding like lower quality shots that somehow end up in goals, especially when you had Matt Ryan, who wasn't saving those longer shots as well as um, Sanchez is now. So, yeah, that's a kind of reason for that. But, yeah, defensively, they're absolutely fantastic. Uh, I think partly it starts from the front as well. Um, their, their pressing is very organised, as you'd expect. Um, counter-pressing as well is good when they, they uh, don't concede counter-attacks too much although that was one of their kind of faults in the start of the season that they were enjoying lots of possession and conceding from the counter-attack but Ben White uh, as you mentioned has been a fantastic um, kind of not acquisition but um, return from from Leeds United for them um, to, to have a young English player that can fit in next to Dunk and Burn as well uh, and can play in a variety of positions because it's shown qualities in defensive midfield like I mentioned as well as at the back um, yeah and someone who's a great defender good in duels and challenges so yeah I think um, that recruitment wise and personnel wise they're very very solid there and also tactically um, they, they control the areas the most important zones very very well. Now, on screen again, we're putting up some of the radars that you sent in from 11 Hacks. And as we say to people, do check out 11 Hacks as well. Their Twitter uh, is easy to find and you'll find some of the information about them on there. But I do want to focus on the two that we've mentioned there, the new additions to the squad this season. What do White and Lamperty, what are their abilities that have really allowed the side to do what they couldn't do last season looking at those radar data yeah so uh white as i mentioned is like he's got very very good off the ball skills but on the ball as well he's um uh, a center back that's very comfortable in possession uh, and helps them with their style someone that um can maybe take a step into the midfield if necessary although webster is the absolute king of that um for brighton so that's uh some an option that they've got um to to bring the center backs dribbling the ball into midfield to pull out an opposition midfield player and create space between the lines. Um, and then on Lamptey, um, he's just been fantastic, or he was before his injury, he was fantastic in, in all areas. He started the season so, so promisingly, so it's a shame that um, his injury kind of disrupted his progress. Um, but yeah, that had to be one of the kind of signings of the season. Um, 
in the beginning. Like he, both on and off the ball, like we have his defensive radar here in ball recoveries, interceptions, um, sliding tackles, air challenges, despite him being only, <laughs> only 165 centimetres, is, is incredible. Um, so yeah, brilliant, brilliant player off the ball. And then on the ball, we saw his qualities, um, whether it's a, a right back in a four or, or right wing back in a five, um, his ability to make runs into the box and also deliver the ball um, was gave Brighton a really, really good option because without him, a lot of their creativity comes from the centre. You've obviously got Trossard, who, who can play wide on the left, but predominantly, I'd say, is a number 10. Um, Trossard, Gross, uh, McAllister, providing a lot of the creativity and you didn't have quite that same threat from the wing, so they could be more predictable to play against. So, yeah, if Lamptey comes in um, back into the team, that would be absolutely huge for them and they can push on even more. And one of the players that you've mentioned there, he's kind of like a new signing. He's been that good this season. It's Paco, Pascal Gross. Uh, it's been a, a great, great season for him. As you've explained there, the good thing about Brighton is the creativity comes across the, the whole of the team. And even when he's not having a good game others can step up but this has to be possibly his best season since that first season in the Premier League looking again at those impressive underlying numbers 4.22 shot creating actions per 90 um, he is kind of tying or vying with Trossard for the player with the best goal creating chances per 90 but he's still doing amazing bits and I think towards the start of the season Gross was coming in and out of the team. But since game week 19, he's been nailed in the side. He's looked so good. He's played a deeper role. And also, interestingly, for me, he has the fourth best minutes per chance created of Premier League regulars. Only Fernandez, De Bruyne and Graylish are doing better than him. I mean, how good is Gross? Uh, will we see him kind of push on towards the end of this season and into next season, maybe getting a lot more assists and maybe goals as well. Yeah, I think um, part of the reason that they maybe went to the diamond system was to be able to fit in three kind of creative or three good centre midfielders behind the striker where they had Trossard, McAllister and Gross. Um, because as you said, they've got creativity coming from lots of places in the midfield and Gross's expected assist numbers are, um, are pretty good and they're pr uh, in line with... Trossards, which is impressive considering Trossard is more of a second striker at times or, or a winger. Um, so, yeah, and, and we can see on Gross's radar, all of his attacking metrics are very, very strong, um, exceptionally strong. So um, he's certainly having a brilliant season and is a very maybe underrated player in that respect. Um, creativity as well in terms of his build-up um, and ability to keep the ball has been fantastic. So... Uh, yeah, I think Pascal Gross is, like you said, certainly being like a new signing for Potter and also maybe a sign of how Graham Potter and his coaching staff can improve players because there's players in the team that are performing better than they were in recent seasons, players that have come from lower levels as well to, and being able to work at that Premier League level, work, operating, as we mentioned, at a like Europa League type level with the performances they're getting and the numbers they're putting up. So, um yeah, massive credit to Pot Potter for keeping him in the team and improving him and also to Gross for, for putting in such great creative numbers. Let's focus, though, on the attack. And the interesting thing for me, you might, again, come in with a different perspective on this, but looking at those underlying numbers, I wouldn't say there's been a huge improvement going forward. I think... What the noticeable change is, is in the play style. So looking at the data, I think one of the problems as well is, and this data actually comes from Albion Analytics. Again, somebody who's great on Twitter, give them a follow. But they explained that Brighton have the lowest shot accuracy in the league with 26%. But one of the other problems that Brighton have is the shots that they are taken are kind of at the keeper. They're not kind of high quality shots. So is this the reason why they're underperforming their attacking data so far this season, Tristan? I think um, they're, they're creating very well in terms of the, the amount of chances they're creating. 
Um, I think, like we said, they've just been kind of unlucky at times and also Mopey's finishing hasn't been at the same level as it has in previous seasons. Uh, Mopey's always been a striker that gets into very good goal-scoring positions, fantastic at it at Brentford and then in his uh, first seasons at, at Brighton too. Um, so I think they, he needs more support sometimes. Um, I think from the midfield, uh, as we said, we've got Trossard, Gross, um, McAllister, very good attacking players, um, but aren't not really players that you, you'd look at and say they definitely provide a goal threat or, or are very good at get, getting into goal scoring positions. Um, so when you're like Brighton and you dominate the ball and you come up against a lot of teams that try and compact the area in and around the box, it's difficult to break them down unless you've got that very, very you know high quality striker that's going to take um, every chance he gets or a striker that can create chances for himself um, more than Mope can. So... Yeah, I, th I think that has been part of the problem and maybe also the attacking variability where they've, as we said, not got the threat from out wide and they're relying a lot on um, maybe low crosses or balls through lots of bodies. Um, if you look at other teams that have similar um, possession stats or come up against similar opposition where they, they come up against maybe a back five and four in front or two banks of four and it's difficult to break them down. The, these are top sides like Man City and Man United who have very, very good attacking players, Liverpool as well, and have very good players that can make something out of nothing. So for Brighton to be in that situation where they can get the ball into the final third with ease because of the quality they've got, um, it, that's very, very encouraging. But but yeah, then sometimes you need that bit of magic or that player that is going to guarantee you a, a goal as much as possible. And, and that's something they don't really have. They've got Mope, who, who puts up very good numbers and, to be honest, who I'd expect to grab some more goals. He's a, an absolute fixture in my fantasy team um, because of his expected goals. Um, but sometimes... Yeah, like I said, doesn't match that up with, with real goals. Um, and then you've got Welbeck and Connolly as well, who are both actually performing in terms of a similar level in terms of their ability to get into positions. Um, two slightly different types of striker. Connolly is fantastic um, against a, a high line. He, he performed very well. I think it was in the first time they played Liverpool. He, he was very, very good. Um, so he provides a different type of option. So I'd like to see them potentially move to a two-striker system more often um, and give Mopay a bit of support. But uh, yeah, in terms of their recruitment in next seasons, bringing in a striker that is going to consistently get into good positions and finish from good positions and also create something for himself um, where Mopay might not be able to do that so often, that is that would be absolutely amazing for them to, to have someone that, that can do that and, and an all-round centre-forward, really. One of the things that Brighton are great at, though, and there can't be any criticism of it too much, is their abilities on set pieces. That's where they get some of their goals. But overall, they're great at defending them as well. They're very good at attacking in the right areas, defending the set pieces in the right way. And the side have also been good with the set pieces that they are taking their sixth best in the league for completed dead ball passes that lead to a shot attempt and talking of the goalkeeper as well Sanchez has actually been a marked improvement as mentioned a little bit earlier with the abilities on the set piece situations but also physically his frame is more imposing on those set piece situations so Tristan from the tactics perspective, can you explain why Brighton are so good, why their set pieces are the envy of many people within the Premier League? I think the the two key things is, and, and we kind of touched on it, I think maybe last week um, as well, talking about Liverpool, um, the two key things with set pieces is the most important is a great delivery taker, um, someone that can put the ball into areas consistently with good quality, good pace on the ball. Um, because if you, you know spend half an hour before the game working on set pieces in training uh, and you have all these great patterns uh, and you get players into good areas loads of times, but then the person who's putting in the ball can't put it into the right spot, then it's, it's pretty useless. So they have um, Gross, who's taken a lot of the 
the corners in particular, uh, who we mentioned, is a very, very good player and has great delivery. Trossard has decent delivery as well, um, as a Sully March. So, the, yeah, they've got that aspect. And then they've also got the, the three huge centre-halves who are so, so good at attacking the ball, which is probably another benefit of as well the three at the back system is that you've got three centre-backs on the pitch who naturally will be better in the air, stronger, taller, um, and gives you lots of variability and options on the set pieces. So if they're, they're coming up against a team and, and you're looking at them and thinking, OK, on, on our set pieces, the main person to, to stop getting a good run onto the ball is um, Lewis Dunk, for example. That's not really the case at Brighton because they've got Dunk, White, Webster, Burn, um, so many players that are great at attacking the ball. Um, that it, it, yeah, like I said, it gives them a variety of options and, uh, and they're very, very well coached in that respect as well. Uh, and good on second balls from set pieces, which is important. So, um, yeah, Brighton are certainly flourishing in, in that area. And I think this all makes them potentially good FPL assets for the end of the season. I think they could be clean sheets. And those defenders, those big defenders that they have, might score a goal or two from those set-piece situations. But one of the reassuring things as well, we've talked about Brighton improving year on year. And of course, we are primary premier injuries so I've got Ben to give us some fantastic data and actually in their first season in the Premier League uh, Brighton had one of the best uh, injury records in the Premier League only 13 significant injuries but they've continued to improve Uh, last season they had a below average record but then since Project Restart the side have had a 94% ability to field their first team players. Overall, only four teams have had a better record last season. I mean, this is fascinating stuff for a relatively small club to to have that ability to keep players on the pitch. And that's so, so important as well. Um, And Ben's noted here that only Solly March and Tariq Lamperty are the big injuries of this campaign but that's so important isn't it Tristan to keep your players on the pitch for a club like Brighton that don't have the biggest amount of resources and it's obviously showing that their coaching staff have that ability to kind of see when the red zones are just from your perspective when you're there on the training pitch does that come from the player kind of saying, oh, I'm feeling a bit sore, a bit rough or something like that. Or is it the coaches kind of looking at the data, knowing the history of the individual and being able to kind of jump in and intervene and say, no, you're not going to play this week? I think um, it's to do with the holistic approach that I mentioned before, where Brighton are looking to have the world-class people in every department. They've clearly got um, obviously I'm not an expert in the area but they've got world class medics and world class people in sports and conditioning that, um, that work with Potter and Potter is a young coach and clearly a forward thinking coach would um, want to take that kind of feedback and advice on board and he's a coach that's used to working in, in clubs like Ostersons with obviously a very very small budget and small resources compared to teams in that league and compared to Premier League teams obviously uh, and Swansea in the Championship as well so not one of the high-flying Premier League teams where you have a huge huge squad and if a player is not performing you can just get rid of him or if a player is injured you can just bring a new one in you know he's used to having to work with what he's got basically so the most important thing is that you keep everyone on the pitch um, you, you rotate players um, so they all get enough minutes, so they stay in form, but then also the ones um, that are playing a lot then get a rest. Uh, and they're lucky enough to have players, um, that, like I mentioned, the strikers, all three of them are, are doing quite well in terms of expected goals. In midfield, they've got a host of midfielders that can create chances. Um, so it, yeah, it shows very, very good squad management, very good coaching, um, uh, and also a forward-thinking approach, even in this very busy um, schedule um, with with Corona fi- fixtures and and things like this that they can uh, continually keep the best players in the side. So one of the final points, uh, unless you want to raise anything at all, Tristan, is what can we expect from Brighton towards the end of the season? Fourteen games left. 
the side sit in 15th. Can we expect more clean sheets, maybe a few more goals, and will they rise above that 15th place position? Yeah, there's absolutely nothing in the data at the moment to suggest that they're going to drop off. Naturally, teams uh, and clubs will have periods of success and then um, after that, periods where they're not doing so well, just because that's football. But yeah, looking at the data and looking at the um, expected goals and expected points, they should keep going. They should um, yeah, yeah, keep expecting good things. Their last result against Villa wasn't ideal, but their performance was very, very good. Um, so Brighton is certainly one of the teams to watch. Um, Guardiola even said he, has his, he admires Potter hugely and he's one of his favourite coaches in the league. So if I was almost any manager in the Premier League, Brighton would be very high up on my list of teams that I don't want to face because um, of their ability on the ball, um, ability in the press. Um, and the one thing they're kind of missing is that ruthless streak up front, um, which is a shame. But yeah, certainly they're, they're a club that still won't concede many goals, but they'll be defensively solid in a way that's very good to watch, unlike some other teams in the league. So um, yeah, won't concede many, will have lots of possession, probably a lot of chances and hopefully they can uh, put the ball in the back of the net as, as much as they can. And um, which FPL assets will be in and around your team that you've got on the watch list or maybe, like you said with Mopai, will stay in there? Yeah, so um, Mopai, he's, he's been in there for a few seasons, coming off my bench here and there. Um, he's, a, he's a nice option for me in there. I've got Ben White also. Um, because like you said, the set piece ability of Brighton and also because he was playing it in midfield as well a bit uh, and because Brighton expected goals against is very, very good. Uh, and they've got the good goalkeeper to match that solid defence now as well. So yeah, if we're looking at, at Brighton in terms of fantasy football, yeah, get those defenders in and then when Lamptey gets back, the thought of having someone that um, is going to get those clean sheet points, but then also going to clean up in terms of assists, hopefully, as well. It would be, uh, yeah, it is huge. So he's going straight back in as soon as he gets a couple of games under his belt. So, um, yeah, it's a very interesting team to, to, to kind of watch and think about from an FPL perspective. And the good thing is as well, because we're known as the differential dinneries here because of Ben, uh, it's a great shout because they're not very much owned in terms of FPL at the moment. But as always, Tristan, and I'm sure people will be looking forward to next week's or the week after, whenever we can fit them in. We're going to try and make these bi-weekly, but looking forward to next time's Tactic Thursday. But for now, I just have to thank you, as always, for your time and your presence here explaining everything today. My pleasure as always. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Have a great rest of the week.